the United States was a month shy of officially entering World War II. Still, a showdown was brewing in the churning, unforgiving waters of the Atlantic. The daring U-boat commander, Eric Topp, had locked his gaze on the American destroyer USS Reuben James. She was positioning herself like a shield between the prowling pack of German submarines and a British convoy, relentlessly launching depth charges into the depths. For Topp, that meant the American destroyer was fair game, neutral or not. The destroyer had gone dark, trying to vanish into the night. But it was a futile action against the relentless hunter U-552. With cold precision, Top aligned his torpedo tubes and unleashed his strike. The torpedo impacted her port side with ruthless accuracy, ripping open a colossal wound. Instantly, her ammunition magazines ignited, setting off a cataclysmic chain reaction. The explosion was monstrous, splitting the warship into flaming fragments, her bow rearing towards the heavens. Desperate sailors leapt into the frigid, oil-slicked embrace of the Atlantic. Rescue ships from the convoy plunged into a race against time as sailors fought for their lives in the sea. The sinking of the Reuben James was a brutal awakening for America. The New York Times proclaimed it the undeniable harbinger of open war with Germany in the Atlantic. Yet this was merely the opening act for Eric Topp as one of the most lethal U-boat commanders in World War II. Eric Topp had a demeanor that belied his remarkable naval intellect. His small, mouse-like features masked a sharp mind and an unassuming but piercing insight. Topp had clear objectives and the tactical savvy to achieve them. In 1934, Topp enlisted in the Kriegsmarine, the German Navy. His initial tenure aboard the light cruiser Karlsruhe lasted six months before he pivoted to the elite and perilous world of U-boats in October 1937. As a watch officer on U-46, Top's unwavering commitment and strategic prowess were unmistakable. These qualities earned him a rapid promotion to commander of U-57 by June 1940, after just four patrols. U-57, a compact 340-ton Type 2C coastal submarine, boasted three torpedo tubes and a 25-strong crew. She was distinctively marked with the insignia of twin red devils on her conning tower, one devil brandishing a torch, the other ensnaring a small boat with Winston Churchill aboard. Top claimed his first victory in his inaugural mission aboard U-57, sinking the 2,160-ton steamer Atos. He followed this triumph by torpedoing the British steamer Dunstan, a North America-bound convoy OB-202 vessel. Top quickly established a reputation for aggressive and daring tactics, characterized by rapid assessment and decisive strikes. His prowess and the fearsome reputation of U-57 began to resonate across the Atlantic, earning him the moniker the Red Devil, and his vessel the title of the Red Devil Boat. Eric Topp's following targets, Haveldar and Manipur, fell prey to his relentless underwater assault. This series of attacks culminated in the sinking of the 10,900-ton freighter Cumberland. Afterward, Topp's U-57 embarked on a devastating spree, obliterating over 30,000 tons of Allied shipping. The British Royal Navy, alarmed by this trail of destruction, initiated a large-scale operation to hunt down the infamous Red Devil. Despite the British warship zeroing in on Topp's position, he showcased his naval skill by evading capture. Narrowly escaping the depth charges, Top delivered a parting blow by sinking Pecton, which plummeted to the ocean's depths in 90 seconds. However, Top's streak of successful engagements took an unexpected turn. On the return journey, U-57 collided with the Norwegian freighter Rona in the Brunsbüttel. This collision severely damaged the German U-boat, which began to flood. The crew, accustomed to wreaking havoc across the Atlantic, suddenly found themselves in a desperate battle for survival. Despite their efforts, the Red Devil boat succumbed to the sea, resulting in the tragic loss of six crew members. Remarkably, Top was absolved of any fault in the incident and continued his rising path as an ace skipper. Despite the loss of U-57, Eric Top's reputation as a wrecking force in submarine warfare remained unscathed. His relentless sinking of Allied vessels earned him command of U-552 on December 4, 1940. U-552, a 626-ton Type 7 submarine, emerged from the Blomen Vosch shipyards in Hamburg, ready to become the new Red Devil boat. Wasting no time, Top, at the helm of U-552, marked his first patrol with a significant victory. On March 1, 1941, they sent the 12,062-ton British tanker Cadillac, sailing from Canada to England with convoy HX-109 to the bottom of the sea. This attack was followed by a bold and aggressive maneuver against the Icelandic trawler Reykjavik. 
Top employed a combination of torpedoes and deck guns in a fearless surface pursuit, showcasing his audacity and tactical aggression. The second patrol of U-552 under Top's command continued this relentless offensive. On April 27, 1941, Top added Commander Horton and the 10,160-ton freighter Beacon Grange to his list of sunken ships. Then came the notorious encounter with the 5,500-ton British freighter Nerissa, a veteran of 12 wartime North Atlantic crossings. On that fateful night, Top, after meticulously stalking the zigzagging Nerissa for nearly two hours, decided to strike. He launched a fan at three torpedoes from a distance of a thousand meters, citing uncertain firing data. The U-552 log noted one torpedo striking Nerissa's stern. Not satisfied, Top delivered a final blow with a fourth torpedo, targeting the freighter's aft starboard side as her crew and passengers desperately launched lifeboats. As Nerissa sank into the abyss, the surface became a scene of chaos and survival. Amidst this turmoil, four small Carly floats drifted hauntingly away, while only six of the eight lifeboats managed to escape the sinking vessel. In a tragic turn, two capsized, one flooded, and the others offered only a precarious haven to those fighting against the merciless sea. The Royal Air Force Coastal Command, operating under the callsign Johnny 502, initiated a frantic nocturnal search operation following the sinking of Nerissa. However, a critical misstep in the transmission of Nerissa's distress signals tragically delayed rescue efforts by over three hours, significantly escalating the human toll of the disaster. Compounding this tragedy, the ship's last known position, relayed using outdated navigation records, led the rescue teams on a futile search, far removed from the actual site of the sinking. Amid this dire situation, HMS Hurricane offered a crucial anti-submarine defense, already laden with survivors from previous maritime tragedies. Despite these valiant efforts, the sinking of Nerissa resulted in the loss of 207 lives. This stark and painful blow stoked anger among Britain and her allies. Eric Topp, undeterred, continued his relentless offensive across the Atlantic, commanding U-552, the new Red Devil boat, to sink several ships on each patrol, etching a path of devastation through Allied shipping lanes. On September 1, 1941, Top was elevated to captain-lieutenant, rewarding his considerable skill and success in naval warfare. Following this promotion, there was a noticeable lull, almost a month without a single ship sinking under his command. However, this hiatus was not an indication of diminished threat. Top's trail of destruction was far from over, and his next chapter would intersect with a mighty adversary, a sleeping giant stirring to action. The United States, though officially neutral in the early stages of World War II, was engaged in a precarious balancing act. By escorting British cargo vessels bound for Great Britain, the U.S. was edging closer to the conflict. The strategic move intensified in March 1941 with the passage of the Lend-Lease Act, a crucial development authorized by President Franklin D. Roosevelt. This legislation empowered the U.S. to provide vital military aid, notably to Great Britain, marking a significant shift in the nation's wartime involvement. The U.S. Navy, operating under a veil of neutrality, assumed a critical role in safeguarding the Atlantic lifeline. Their primary mission was escorting convoys brimming with Lend-Lease supplies through the perilous waters to Britain. This task was a collaborative effort. The Royal Canadian Navy escorted these convoys to Newfoundland, where the U.S. Navy took over, shepherding them through the North Atlantic before handing them off to the British Royal Navy. Disguised as an operation to support American forces in Iceland, this mission also covertly extended protection to merchant ships from nations like Great Britain. This operation, a thinly veiled challenge to the isolationist policies in Congress, certainly did not go unnoticed by the Kriegsmarine. As U.S. ships increasingly faced attacks in a series of contentious incidents, the United States edged incrementally closer to full-scale war. Yet, no U.S. ship had been sunk, a situation about to change. The crew of the Reuben James, fully cognizant of the escalating danger, prepared for the worst. Chief machinist's mate Alton Cousins left his gold watch with his wife, unwilling to risk its loss in what he feared might be his final voyage. Commanded by Lieutenant Commander Haywood L. Tex Edwards, a Naval Academy graduate of 1926 and former Olympian, USS Reuben James set sail from Argentia, Newfoundland, on October 23, 1941. She was part of a task force of five destroyers, guarding over 50 merchant ships in convoy HX-156, many under the Union Jack. 
However, only USS Niblack was equipped with radar, leaving Reuben James and her crew to rely on binoculars and the rudimentary method of listening for submarine propellers by pressing an ear against the ship's hull. The Reuben James met her fate on the eerie morning of October 31st, 1941. Sailing 600 miles west of Ireland, she maneuvered in a complete blackout, a tactic designed to evade U-boat periscopes lurking in the dark Atlantic waters. But Top, commanding his Red Devil submarine, was already hot on her tail. With calculated precision, Top awaited the optimal moment to strike. His torpedo tubes aligned perfectly, so he unleashed a torpedo that violently struck Reuben James' port side, triggering the forward magazine. The ensuing explosion was catastrophic, ripping the Reuben James in two. Survivors of the Reuben James were left in shock as they witnessed the destruction. Electrician's mate Thomas Trumbull vividly recalled the horrific moment, quote, The whole front of the ship lifted up and it was gone, gone in an instant. Midships was now the bow. The blast left survivors with no option but to leap into the icy Atlantic. Reuben James, equipped with only two lifeboats, offered no solace. The torpedo obliterated one, and the other was impossible to lower due to the ship's severe list. As the survivors fought to stay afloat, a new horror emerged. Unsecured depth charges from the Reuben James plunged into the water as she sank. The terrified sailors heard the charges arm and then detonate, violently casting debris and men skyward. Fireman Second Class George Girrell somberly recounted, quote, If it hadn't been for those depth charges, we probably would have had another 40 or 50 survivors. Some were knocked unconscious, others were torn apart. Rescue ships swiftly converged to save those struggling in the water. Of Reuben James's crew, a mere 45 were rescued. 99 sailors, including all seven officers, perished in the attack. Among those lost was Alton Cousins, whose premonition about his gold watch proved tragically correct. For Top, this attack was another notch in his belt, cementing his status as one of the most fearsome U-boat commanders of the war. But for the United States, the sinking was a grievous insult. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill conveyed his condolences to President Roosevelt, lamenting the loss of Reuben James and her crew. The London Daily Mail ominously speculated that the United States was inching closer to declaring war. Yet at that moment, the U.S. held back. It would take another devastating blow, a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, to fully rouse the sleeping giant and propel the United States into the global conflict. Eric Topp's unparalleled career as a U-boat commander continued into early 1942 with a series of successful engagements. On January 15th, he and his crew of U-552 sank the 4,100-ton steamer Day Rose. This was swiftly followed by the sinking of the American steamer Francis Salmer on the 18th and the 6,250-ton Dutch tanker Okana on January 25th. Topp's patrols during this period were marked by relentless efficiency. He orchestrated another devastating spree, sinking six ships in rapid succession. This campaign of destruction, in which he claimed 35,000 tons of shipping, including five tankers, did not go unnoticed by Germany. In recognition of his extraordinary accomplishments, Top was awarded the oak leaves to his Knight's Cross, becoming the 87th recipient of this prestigious honor. In June, Top's relentless pursuit continued. While patrolling, he targeted convoy HG-84, one of the Gibraltar convoys, and successfully sank five ships. Then on August 3rd, Top turned his attention to convoy ON-115. During this engagement, he sank the 7,160-ton Belgian steamer Belgian soldiers and inflicted damage on the 10,600-ton British tanker GS Walton. Returning from this patrol, Top was celebrated as a hero and awarded the swords to his Knight's Cross, becoming the 17th recipient of this award. However, this marked the end of Top's war patrols with U-552. Top was subsequently assigned command of the 27th U-boat flotilla at Gottenhafen. In this role, he was instrumental in training new U-boat crews and crafting battle instructions for the new Type 21 electroboat submarines. Top transitioned from a top combat ace to a vital advisor in the development and tactical assessment of these advanced submarines. In the final weeks of the war, Fregat and Kapitan Top took command of U-2513, a Type 21 submarine. Although neither Top nor U-2513 engaged in combat, the submarine was surrendered at Horten, Norway on May 8, 1945. Top's legacy as Germany's third highest-ranking U-boat commander remained intact. At the war's end, 
he was swiftly released by Britain after his capture, as he was viewed as having played a strictly military role during the war and was known for his disinterest in politics. Later, as an officer in the West German Navy, Top's strategic expertise earned him a significant advisory role in the U.S. Pentagon. His time there showed once more the enduring value placed on his tactical acumen, long after his days of glory in World War II had passed.